This is the second video in a two-part series. The first video was posted on 3Blue1Brown. Go watch that one first if you haven't seen it yet. In the previous video, we learned the basics of how certain parameters, like temperature, influence the large-scale behavior of huge numbers of tiny interacting particles. We saw how this led to different phases of matter, as well as phase transitions between them where the equilibrium behavior changes sharply as the parameters are varied smoothly. In this video, we'll go more in depth and study a simplified version of the model from the previous video, which we can essentially completely understand using basic math. By the end, we'll understand mathematically what drives the existence of different phases in this model and see exactly when and why we get a phase transition. Last time we introduced the Boltzmann distribution, which is the correct distribution of microstates at a fixed temperature and chemical potential. We used this to model a fluid with molecules living in a rectangular lattice of pixels, and saw how this led to a liquid phase and a gas phase with a phase transition between them. We also saw that at high enough temperatures, there's a phase of supercritical fluid which interpolates smoothly between liquid and gas with no sharp phase transition. In this video, we'll study an even simpler version of this model, where we essentially forget about the geometry of the underlying space. To see what I mean, remember that in the previous video, the energy of a microstate was given by minus 1 times the number of pairs of molecules that are next to each other in the lattice of pixels. Knowing when things are next to each other depends on the geometry of the lattice. We can think about it as a relationship between neighboring pixels. In order to forget about the geometry, one simple thing we could do is just suppose that every pixel is next to every other pixel, meaning that the relationship of being next to looks something like this. The energy is still the number of pairs of molecules that are next to each other, but now this means something different, since all molecules that are present are interacting with each other simultaneously. The nice thing about this is that we can actually write the energy in terms of the number of molecules directly since every molecule is next to every other molecule. So the energy is just minus 1 times the total number of pairs of molecules, which is the number of molecules n in the microstate x, all squared. There is one more thing we need to do, though. This change actually increases the magnitude of the energy by a lot, and we need to correct that. In the original model, the minimum possible energy is attained by the microstate with all lattice sites containing a molecule. The energy of this microstate is about minus 2 times v, where v is the volume, which is the total number of pixels. This is because most of the pixels have four neighbors, ignoring the relatively minor discrepancies along the boundary, and each pair is counted twice. But in our new model, the minimum energy is minus v squared. To fix this, we'll just multiply the energy function by 2 over v, so that the two models have roughly the same minimum energy. In other words, the energy of a microstate is now minus 2 over v, times n of x squared, where again n of x is the total number of molecules in the microstate x. Since we have a division by v, the total number of pixels, this can be thought of as averaging, or taking the mean effect of all pixels on each individual pixel. For this reason, this is often called the mean field approximation. The word field here comes from magnetic field, because these models were first studied from the magnetic perspective which we discussed briefly in the last video. Let's see what our Boltzmann distribution looks like now. Remember, the probability of a particular microstate x is proportional to the exponential of minus 1 over the temperature t times the energy E of x, plus the chemical potential C over temperature times the number of molecules N of x. Now we can replace E of x by our new energy function and simplify, and we find that the new probability of x is proportional to the exponential of 2 over Tv times N of x squared, plus c over t times n of x. Before we go any further, let's just see a simulation of this Boltzmann distribution, again using a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm like we talked about last time. I'm decreasing the resolution a lot, since it's much more difficult for my computer to run the simulation due to the fact that each pixel is affected by every other pixel now. Notice that we still see a phase transition at low temperatures as the chemical potential crosses this critical line, and at high temperatures, the density changes smoothly without a phase transition. We also still have the metastability behavior, meaning that if we just barely cross the line of phase transition, it will take a really long time for the transition to actually happen. One big thing that changed now is that we don't see those cool looking droplet shapes as the phase transition happens. 
Instead, the transition sort of happens everywhere all at once, and this makes sense because the relative positions of the pixels on the screen actually mean nothing at this point. In fact, as we can see from the Boltzmann distribution, the only thing that differentiates one microstate from another is the molecule number, n of x. This means that different configurations with the same number of molecules also have the same probability. So if we want to fully understand this Boltzmann distribution, we really only need to see how the distribution of n of x behaves. We really want to understand the phase diagram of this model, which is a description of the macroscopic behavior as a function of t and c. Last time we used the density of molecules as our notion of macroscopic behavior. And conveniently, the density is just n of x over v, meaning that the Boltzmann distribution can also be written in terms of the density directly. To do that, let's call the density d of x. Then we can replace n of x by v times d of x and simplify the formula. We find that the probability of a particular microstate is proportional to the exponential of v over t times 2 d of x squared plus c d of x. Our goal for the rest of this video is to see how to use this information to figure out the phase diagram of our mean field model. In other words, we want to figure out which density is most likely, given the parameters t and c. So what is the probability that we see a particular density? In other words, for some fixed number, little d, between 0 and 1, what's the probability that our random density, big D of x, equals little d? Well, for each microstate with density little d, the probability of that particular microstate is proportional to the exponential of v over t times 2d squared plus cd. But we also need to know how many microstates have density d. There are v pixels in total, and for a microstate to have density d, it must have d times v molecules. So let's only consider values of d for which d times v is actually a non-negative integer. For these values, there are exactly v choose dv configurations of dv molecules in v pixels since we just need to choose which pixels have molecules in them. So the probability that big D of x equals little d is the same common exponential factor times this number of microstates with density d. Let's simplify by putting everything in the exponent using a logarithm. We find that the probability of seeing density little d is proportional to the exponential of v over t times 2d squared plus cd plus log of v choose dv. Let's just pause here for a minute to see what we've got. We can interpret the first term here as minus one over t times the energy of microstates with density d, and the second term as the entropy of microstates with density d. In other words, this is the same type of problem we were discussing earlier in the previous video. Maximizing this is the same as minimizing e minus t times s, which is the free energy. But in order to solve this optimization problem, we'll need to get a better handle on this entropy term, the logarithm of v choose dv. Unlike the other term, which is just a polynomial in d, this thing could be kind of complicated, and it's not yet clear exactly how it behaves. We're going to approximate this by a simpler function of d, namely minus v times d log d plus 1 minus d log 1 minus d. This is sometimes called Stirling's approximation, and I think it's worth it to see how this kind of approximation can be proved. So let's quickly do that right now. The first thing is to rewrite v choose dv as v factorial over dv factorial times the factorial of one minus d times v. The logarithm of v choose dv then becomes the log of v factorial minus the log of dv factorial minus the log of one minus dv factorial. And now we just need to understand the logarithm of a factorial. Now, for a number n, what is the log of n factorial? Well, n factorial is the product of the numbers k going from 1 to n, and so the log of n factorial is the sum of log k for k going from 1 to n. This is well approximated by the integral of log x, where x goes from 1 to n. The integral of log x is x log x minus x, and so the value of this integral is n log n minus n plus 1. Also, the total size of the pieces that we're missing in the approximation of the sum by the integral is at most log n, so the error in our approximation is only logarithmic in n. We can also just absorb this plus 1 into that error, and get that log of n factorial is n log n minus n plus an error of order log n. That's what this notation with an o means. 
plugging this in for n equals v, dv, and 1 minus dv, we can do a bit of algebra to obtain minus v times d log d plus 1 minus d log 1 minus d, exactly what we want, plus an error term which is logarithmic in v. Now we can plug this back into the expression we had for the probability that the density of a microstate x from the Boltzmann distribution is d. We can factor out the v from everything inside the exponential, and we find that the probability is proportional to the exponential of the volume v times a relatively simple function of the density d, plus an error of logarithmic size. Let's call this function ftc of d. Since the logarithmic error is much smaller than v itself, the value of ftc of d gives a good picture of this probability. And the density d which maximizes the function ftc is exponentially more likely than any other density. This means that as soon as v is reasonably large, there's basically no chance of seeing a state with a density that's much different from the maximizing density. In other words, the density in our phase diagram, as a function of the temperature t and the chemical potential c, is the density d which maximizes ftc. Unfortunately, because of these logarithms, there actually isn't a simple exact formula for the maximizing density d as a function of t and c. But any computer can easily numerically solve this optimization problem and get an extremely accurate answer in a matter of milliseconds. This is much faster than running our Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation to try and approximate the phase diagram. So for all intents and purposes, we can say that we've solved the phase diagram problem. The formula for FTC can also give us some intuition for why a phase transition happens. Here's a plot of this function, although I'm actually shifting it by the maximum value, so it's easier to follow the maximizer as we tweak the parameters. When the temperature T is high, as we vary the chemical potential C, we see that the maximizing density changes smoothly. This is the supercritical fluid phase, which smoothly interpolates between a liquid and a gas, with no phase transition. Now for low temperature, watch what happens to the maximizer. It suddenly jumps from one place to the other as C crosses minus two. This is exactly what causes the phase transition. It's simply due to the fact that for low temperatures, the function FTC is not concave. And so even as the function itself changes smoothly, the maximizer can jump from one location to another discontinuously. Let's see what temperature regime we can expect this behavior in. Setting the chemical potential C equals minus two, when the temperature T is bigger than one, we see a unique maximizing density D equals half. But when T goes below one, the maximizer splits into two maximizing densities which are symmetric about the value one half. And when C is some value other than minus two, one of the two maximizers will take over, leading to one phase or the other. I think this is a pretty amazing and basic explanation for how phase transitions can happen. The equilibrium behavior of our physical system is determined by an optimization problem. In some cases, the optimization problem is non-concave, which means that the solution can suddenly jump from one place to another, even when the parameters of the problem are changed smoothly. Of course, the model that we've been studying in this video is a massive simplification of the real-world physics of intermolecular interactions. We've basically abstracted away the true intermolecular force beyond recognition, and our molecules have no meaningful shapes to them, and we're totally ignoring kinetic energy. And while real molecules live in a three-dimensional space, it doesn't even make sense to ask about the dimension in our model. There's literally just no geometry at all. The fact that we still get a phase diagram that looks something like the real H2O phase diagram in this region over here is kind of incredible then. It means that we've hit on something more fundamental than any of the other details about real-world water molecules. This is the true power of mathematical abstraction, in my opinion. By removing as many unnecessary details as we possibly can, as long as whatever phenomenon we care about still arises, there should still be at least a kernel of the true cause of that phenomenon. There is so much more to explore here, and if you're curious and want to go further, I've included some links in the description to helpful resources. But that's all for this series of videos. Thanks for watching.